Shaw. Good evening. I'm Ari Mermelstein, the Assistant Director of the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization. And, behalf, on, and on behalf of the Center and the Diener Institute for Jewish Law, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's panel, Conversion to Judaism Through the Ages, Historical and Theoretical Reflections. The Center for Jewish Law, whose motto is Ancient Traditions, New Conversations, is a vibrant academic center that aims to enrich Jewish studies, the legal academy, and contemporary civilization broadly conceived by creating and sustaining a diverse and collaborative intellectual community that re-examines and reconsiders classical Jewish texts with an ever-growing set of new conceptual tools. The Center for Jewish Law, which is directed by Professor Suzanne Last Stone, accomplishes this goal through graduate, through graduate, undergraduate, and law school fellowship programs by the hosting of public and private lectures, working groups, and symposia, through the publication of a peer-reviewed journal, and the support and participation of a physical and online community. In a similar way, the Leonard and B. Diener Institute of Jewish Law supports conferences, symposia, and scholarship on issues of Jewish law. It's my pleasure to acknowledge the presence of Marjorie Diener Blendon, who is a great friend of the center and has been instrumental in allowing the center to realize its goal. We're privileged to have with us tonight a distinguished set of, pa of panelists. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this evening's panel, Professor Deborah Kaplan, who will introduce the presentations in order. Professor Kaplan is the Dr. Pinchas Churgin Memorial Associate Professor, Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University and is currently the Associate Chair for Jewish History at Yeshiva College. She was voted the Lillian F. and William L. Silber Professor of the Year and also held a Yad, Yad Hanadiv Bracha Fellowship in Jerusalem. Her research centers on the early modern period and her interests include social history, autobiographical texts, the Protestant Reformation, and Jewish-Christian relations. Professor Kaplan recently published Beyond Expulsion, a study of Jewish-Christian relations during the Reformation with, Stan with Stanford University Press. She is a member of the Academic Advisory Council for the Center of Jewish History and also sits on the advisory board of the Early Modern Workshop. There are handouts that are going to be going around in a second for Professor Zohar and for Professor Counterfogel. If you haven't yet received uh, the handouts, they'll be circulating in a second. Thank you, Professor Mermelstein. Thanks to all of you for coming to what I think will be a wonderful and enlightening evening on a really historically exciting and relevant topic. I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, my esteemed colleague, Ephraim Countervogel, who is the E. Billy Ivory Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University's Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies. Winner of a National Jewish Book Award and a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research, Professor Kannerfogel is an internationally recognized authority in the fields of medieval Jewish intellectual history and rabbinic literature, in which he has published four books and more than 60 articles and edited two volumes. He has twice been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Jewish Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and has held visiting professorial appointments at Penn and at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Professor Kannerfogel. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaplan. I, I listened very carefully to the motto of the uh, Institute as Ari uh, described it, and it sounded uh, not only very good, but very effective. My motto is very simple, try to finish on time, and I'm not going to be as good at it, I suspect, as the Institute is at theirs, but we'll try. Uh, you should have for me a single page uh, which does two things. It gives you a manuscript text, uh, which is somewhat unusual, and we'll talk about that. And it gives you a scorecard uh, for the players, the Ashkenazic authorities that we'll be speaking about, so you can sort of at least seem to show me that you're following them as I talk about them. Uh, the other uh, aim of the handout is very simple. Uh, if you tend to nod off, the paper will probably drop and you will probably wake up. So as long as you don't throw it at me as an airplane, they're yours to keep. And in all seriousness, I hope that you enjoy. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit at the beginning and the end. I'll try to do some examples in the middle sort of in a more uh, discursive fashion, um, and obviously we'll have a lot of time for discussion afterwards, I hope. More than a half century ago, Jacob Katz briefly sketched the attitudes that the Tosafists of northern France and Germany, and here I'm talking prim primarily about medieval Ashkenaz, I think my colleagues will take us to Svarad and to other places and later periods, 
Uh, Katz did a sketch of the attitudes that these Tosafists displayed toward potential converts to Judaism. In doing so, he identified several key Talmudic interpretations and halachic constructs that might serve as the axes around which the rabbinic positions could be charted. Crucial to this undertaking is the ability to distinguish between the attitude of a particular rabbinic authority to an individual convert or ger of whom he was aware, and his sense of how welcoming the Jewish community should be, according to Jewish law, pi halacha, to the institution of conversion gerut as a whole. As an extreme formulation or example of this problematic, one cannot properly assess Maimonides' overall approach to conversion solely on the basis of the fact that he was obviously quite impressed and encouraged by the commitment and knowledge of Avad Yahager. In medieval Ashkenaz as well, leading Tosafists and halachic authorities had interactions with individual converts. These relationships do not, however, automatically signal that the authority in question favored the steady acceptance of converts as a matter of halachic or communal policy. And just a case in point, Professor Katz quotes the German Tosafist Joel ben Isaac of Bonn, who died around the year 1200, who talked about a convert that he had met, quote, and the spirit went forth from the Lord and rested in the heart of that man, Rabbi Abraham, son of Abraham, our father. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon him, and Rabbi Yoel goes on to talk about what this particular convert did. Professor Katz concluded that, quote, to conceive of the act as the descent of God's spirit into the heart of the proselyte presupposes a positive evaluation of the conversion. That's certainly correct. Rabbi Yoel most certainly judged this conversion to be a success, as the citation that Katz uh, includes indicates. Indeed, Yoel further characterized this ger, whom he had the opportunity to observe for a lengthy period of time, as Ishtam v'yashar Yoshev Ohalim, putting two biblical verses together to testify to his knowledge and moral uh, uh, excellence. Rabbi Yoel's consistent recognition of the sincerity and religious integrity of this convert do not, however, demonstrate that he was necessarily supportive of ongoing conversions as a desired result. And similarly, without going through all the details, we have in the Crusade Chronicles uh, from Ashkenaz that reflect the First Crusade, in this case of 1096 and beyond, uh, a particular Ger Tzedek, a righteous convert in the northern Rhineland town uh, of Zantis, who inquired of a certain Rabbi Moses HaKohen as to what his fate would be if he slaughtered himself in the name of the Holy One. Rabbi Moses responds that he, the convert, would thus be joined together with all of the other Jewish martyrs, Imanu Teshev B'mechitzatenu, he will dwell with all of us. At the same time, however, he would also be situated along with other converts to Judaism. So, as I will say in a moment, equal but separate. Ki ger tzedek tiyeh v'teshev im sha'ar tzadikim gerei tzedek b'mechitzatam v'tihiyeh im Avraham avinu shahaya tchila l'geirim. Clearly, Rabbi Moses wanted to encourage and to praise the convert in this instance, but his response also suggests, as I indicated, that the righteous converts would still be separated in some way from the rest of the righteous. In any case, it is difficult to translate the very positive sentiments expressed in this passage to the larger context of conversion as a whole. Here, the act of martyrdom was to render this convert rather special, and yet, even in this instance, there is a measure of separation presumed before, between fully righteous converts and those righteous Jews who were born as Jews, although to be sure, this particular rabbi Moses is not identified as a known rabbinic or halachic authority. And moreover, Samson, Solomon ben Samson's crusade chronicle does not carry with it any inherent halachic valence. In a similar vein, the leading 12th century northern French Tosafist, and this is a rabbinic scholar of great note, Rabbi Isaac Ri Hazakain of Dompierre, and on your programs, he's the first northern French figure on the left-hand side, wrote, quote, that if potential, con I'm sorry, if potential proselytes are persistent in their sincere desire to convert, mitam tzimli hit and are not brought along too, quick, too quickly, or for purposes of marriage, again, I'm quoting, we should surely accept them, very favorable. At the same time, however, Ri also maintains in another passage, here I quote again, that the divine presence rests fully only with families of pure lineage. In short, we are dealing here with some rather nuanced texts and conceptions, both halachic and non-halachic, whose valences are not always unified or unequivocal, to say the least. 
Now, Katz and several other scholars who've treated conversion in medieval Ashkenaz, and for those who are interested later, I can give you a brief bibliography. There have been just a few, but some very good treatments. In more recent years, there's an article by Ben Sion Wacholder that came out in Jewish Quarterly Review the very same time that, that Katz published his work, just around 1960. All of these scholars maintain that the rabbinic attitudes toward converts in northern France and Germany were fundamentally similar. And that when, when and where attitudes did change, they did so in similar and parallel ways. What I'd like to do tonight in the time that I have is briefly argue on the basis of some manuscript passages and a concomitant rereading of published materials that in fact it is possible to show that the Tosafists, and the Tosafists are you know, not people who put up their fists or people who like toast, but they are people who are the leading Ashkenazic commentators of the Talmud succeeding and following Rashi in both northern France and Germany. So that the Tosafists in northern France were more welcoming and tolerant of converts over time than their German counterparts. As I want to argue for a bifurcation within medieval Ashkenaz. This can be seen not only with regard to the interpretation of descriptive Talmudic passages, but also in ways that these authorities framed and discussed the halachic requirements for conversion. This dichotomy is further supported by the available evidence from both Jewish and Christian sources, which suggests, and this is very uh, tricky evidence to work with, but nonetheless, the evidence suggests that there was a steadier stream of converts to Judaism in northern France than in Germany during the 12th and 13th centuries, and even more sig significantly, by aspects of the self-image of these often like-minded, yet ultimately distinct centers of Jewish life and scholarship in northern Europe. Since one of my doctoral students is here, who shall not be identified unless he wishes to be, uh, I will mention what I like to say to my graduate students. Uh, those who never see any difference between northern France and Germany are missing an awful lot. Those who, those who always see a difference are making a mistake. But in this particular in, in instance, I think there's a very interesting difference. And because of the sensitivity of the topic of conversion, it becomes particularly important. Moreover, this distinction between northern France and Germany can also be correlated with the nature of the relationship between the Jewish populace in each of these distinct geographic centers and the various groups of churchmen and church figures who lived and served there. So I'm going to argue that there's a possible internal explanation, something about the way the rabbinic authorities and communities thought in these two centers, and something very important about the way the Jews and the Christians interacted or didn't interact in these two centers. Not surprisingly, dedicated converts to Judaism tended to reach out to or to be brought to the attention of leading Tosafists in both of these areas, in both northern France and Germany, and in turn, these rabbinic figures who were often impressed with the achievements and devotion of these converts welcomed them into their homes and otherwise expressed their guidance and support. A sharp difference, however, appears in the level of rabbinic involvement with those who sought to convert to Judaism at a point prior to their conversions. In a word, French Tosafists deal with specific questions of what I'll call pre gerut cases, people who are candidates for conversion. As far as we can tell, Germans do not. The argument from silence will be lessened by a number of factors, as I will indicate during the talk. We do have plenty, plenty instances of German Tosafists who have converts in their home, who decide matters of law for those converts after the conversion. I have exactly one instance of a case in Germany of a convert around the year 1100, of a case in Germany of a convert coming before German rabbinic authorities for pre-conversion guidance. Whereas in northern France, this can be found not commonplace, but this can be found uh, quite frequently. Um, so let me uh, cut to the chase here in order to sort of uh, adhere to my not so well kept motto of finishing on time. Um, and, and just a second general point, I'll give you the examples. Um, what's also surprising here is that the French Tosafists have not Maiselach in the popular sort of, uh, you know, superficial sense, but they have lots of cases about these converts which they share pre conversion. The Germans say not a word. That's very odd because in terms of their presentation, German Tosafists are much more likely and much better known for sharing cases. This is my opinion. What's your opinion? When it comes to pre-conversion discussion, again, not a one. And the Frenchmen, who are not such big sharers, they like to sort of intellectually go out on their own, 
they have cases which in fact do seem to go around a little bit. That again is part of the way I'm going to begin to argue that we're not just dealing with absence of data, but we're dealing with an intended approach here or an intended difference in approach. Let me give you a good example of a French interaction, and that's the manuscript passage that you have in front of you, which comes from a very interesting gloss of Sefer Mordechai, late 13th century Germany, uh, a manuscript found in the Bishop's Seminary in Vercelli. That's a whole separate other interesting story, not for now, unless you want to ask about it later. But in there, we find a case, as I've outlined it for you here. I'm not going to read every word, but the case essentially talks about a maisa, a case, maaset. Shebaal ri, where ri of Dom Pierre, uh, had a potential convert who had been circumcised at night in the presence of three judges, except that the three judges were not quite kosher for this purpose, since two of them were brothers-in-law. They were married to two sisters. So you have two brothers-in-law and a third judge. And the question is, since conversion, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, because there's a lot here, and I'm sure my colleagues will pick up on this too. Since conversion has a status of mishpat, requires judicial process, three judges are required. Those judges ostensibly have to function as they would in any basic procedure of the Jewish court, rabbinic court. They can't be related. So they're related. And the circumcision takes place at night. Again, Jewish court proceedings typically must take place by day. So we have reyuta, two problems. Heshivri re-responded that since, and this is the only text where we have this full version, re responded since the circumcision took place at night, it doesn't count. Right? And he says, similar to the immersion of a convert, if the immersion took place at night, that would be problematic as well because mishpat ktiv bey, judicial process requires a daytime operation. And as, you know, if that's the case, in this particular case, the circumcision was alleged to have taken place at night. The convert, the ger, the potential ger, has to undergo hatafat dambrit. A further drop of blood has to be drawn in honor of the conversion. That is the in lieu of circumcision. In other words, the circumcision didn't count. And then he counsels, from here on out, be careful to do all of this by day and by three kosher judges, three people who can sit as judges together in this way, that none of them should have things that disqualify them in this regard. And then he says, even though in fact, Kabbalat Torah Moshe Sagi Min HaTorah Im Yesham Beitin Afilu Lo Yubishat Mila Velo Bishat Fila, even though at least ex post facto, it's okay if there's a full Jewish court present only for the acceptance of mitzvot by the convert before we get to immersion and before we get to circumcision. There's got to be a firm commitment to observe the commandments, and there's a whole Talmudic and medieval uh, uh, list here of what has to be done. That requires a court. The subsequent circumcision for a male and immersion might not require a court, and he quotes a Talmudic passage from Tractate Yivamot to that effect, but the truth of the matter is that really only works. He holds ex post facto a priori. There should be, whenever possible, as he concludes, to have everything sort of on the up and up. So he lets it through, and it's interesting, um, the two brothers-in-law don't bother him so much because it means that at least one brother-in-law and one non-brother-in-law was involved in this uh, this part of the conversion as well, but that sort of gives you a pretty good and full treatment of Ri's position. Now what happens in subsequent Tosafo texts, they are sometimes even a little bit more lenient than the Ri. We have examples where Tosafo says, really, not a priori, but close. The three judges are required only for the acceptance of mitzvot. There is no full requirement for all of this for the circumcision and for the uh, tevila. What's interesting here is we may have a slight disconnect between an actual, this was a responsum or an actual psak, an actual ruling of the re, and so we might have a slight disconnect here literarily, which happens not infrequently, between the theoretical Talmudic discussion, the printed and published Tosafot right, on the Talmud, 
and the ruling which the particular rabbinic authority actually gives. But again, it's clear that there is some room for leniency here. And I have another example of a standard Tosfot, the Tractate of Oda Zara, where apparently someone came up with a problem. They had accepted mitzvot properly. They had immersed. And there is, again, re-acceptance at the time of immersion. But once that main acceptance has been done, that's the key. And somehow, I'm sorry, they had been circumcised properly, and the particular fellow didn't get the immersion right. It doesn't say what the problem was. Um, and in that case, re-rules, according to a student, Judah Sirleon, who you have on your uh, lists here as well, um, a student of the re, that such a person is not a full gear, but if he touches Jewish wine, he does not render it unfit. Again, there's some room to do something with even this deficient type of procedure. Um, Rees' student, Samson of Sans, who you have here, doesn't talk about um, uh, this part of the process, but he refers uh, to an actual case involving a minor, a little baby. He is described as having uh, recounted the difficulties, the physical difficulties, that we were experienced in performing the ritual circumcision or extraction of blood for purposes of, of conversion on, you, on a one-year-old Christian child, in our neighborhood, meaning this was going on. So conversion of adults, conversion of minors. Talmudically, ger katan matbila motal dat beitin. There's a Talmudic procedure for that. That was going on, and they got stuck a little bit, very bad pun not intended, with the circumcision portion of the program, but that just shows that these things were going on. So all of these French authorities have real cases, real leniencies, not always, but real decisions and so on. Again, if you look at Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, Moses of Kusi, who's on your list here, who's a student of Judah Sirloin, it's all on the line here. This is a halachic text. He doesn't talk about actual cases, it's prescriptive, but he has a lot of these leniencies as well. And most interestingly, the Talmud in one place says that part of the acceptance portion of the program is that you tell the potential convert, male or female, uh, except for the circumcision, it's all the same. Um, you tell the female, the, the convert, uh, some of the very difficult punishments and responsibilities, you kind of lay it on very heavy. The Talmud in one place seems to suggest that's in order to perhaps dissuade them. Right? We have to try to dissuade. Moses of Kusi, without citing a particular source, says, well, but that's also in order that if the convert accepts, he shouldn't learn later of things that he accepted that he didn't know about. You know, it's a caveat emptor. That's a much different reasoning in terms of why you explain uh, these various mitzvot. So France, and again, I've pretty much gone down my roster here, not that I'm being graded. Uh, France pretty much, uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries, rabbinic authorities have actual pre-conversion cases. They sometimes rule leniently. They make accommodations. Ger Katan, minor gerim. Um, the very interesting Natanel ben Yosef of Shinon is quoted in Tosfot. Tosfot asks at one point, well, we know you really do need a court of three for the acceptance of mitzvot. Today, our courts may not be qualified to do this. And Tosfot says somewhat remarkably two answers. One is, it's like lending money. Really, you need experts to do that, too, to judge those cases. But if we don't allow courts to sit, lenders won't lend because they'll never be able to get their money back if there's a problem. Shalot tinol delet bifnei lavin says Tosfot, for the same reason, three judges can serve even if they don't have, and I say expertise, they're qualified, but they don't have to be super qualified, whatever that means. They don't have to have smicha of the original Palestinian sense of the temple period. Why? We don't want to slam the door in the face of converts. That's a very French statement. And Natanel of Shinon adds the verse in the Torah that talks about Gerim in one place says, It's a permanent possibility. It has to be viable and possible in every generation. We will not turn off the pipeline according to the Torah itself. Very interesting. If I go to Germany just for a minute or two and sort of give you the other side, we see a very different picture. And again, if you just go through your roster now, um, Eliezer ben Nathan of Mainz, Ra'avan, again, a little bit older than the Re, has two discussions of uh, problems of conversion. One of them is only about the Talmudic sugya. It never gets out of a discussion of the Talmud. There are no actual cases. And there's a question that his son-in-law asked him, his learned son-in-law asked, one sugya in the Talmud says that we should dissuade the converts from converting by telling them some of these difficult requirements. And there's another sugya later in the same tract, taking Yavamot, which says, we don't want to look like we're discouraging conversion too much. 
there's some kind of a contradiction. Uh, basically, Ra'avan says, well, um, uh, uh, there, there's a difference in circumstance. Uh, it's talking about different cases, fundamentally different cases. He doesn't begin to suggest, as uh, Moses of Kusi does, uh, perhaps the, um, uh, the insisting on telling him the punishments is not just about dissuading him. Perhaps it's about fairness. Perhaps it's to make sure that he knows what he has to know. Uh, he doesn't see that at all. He sticks with the Talmud. We're telling him these hard things to dissuade, in order to dissuade him. That happens again in a completely different sugya where he sticks with this Talmudic formulation. Um, he includes a very brief, brief paraphrase of the sugya in Ketubot that minor converts can be converted without any cases. And he concludes, however, his whole discussion with a brief paraphrase of the Talmudic discussion of Amot 48b, which is a bright on the theme of why Geirim suffer and are downtrodden at this time. So it's a much less, happy is not the right word, but it's a much different picture. What's even more interesting is his grandson, Ravia, who's on your list here, uh, who dies in 1225, and again, parallel in time to some of the figures that we've discussed, Ravia actually says that the sugya, perfect, the sugya of Ger Katan, of converting minor children, as we understand it, does not apply. That sugya only applies under the assumption of all the French Tosafists and probably almost everyone else in this part of the medieval period is that any minor who was brought to the rabbinic court to be converted may be converted, right, as the Talmud says, prior to, and this is again for him or for her, prior to their reaching bar or bat mitzvah, they must be apprised of that conversion. If they don't demur, their conversion is 100% good. If they were not told and do demur, it's canceled. But Ger Katan is available. Again, interesting issues in modern times. Does it depend who will raise the, the young Ger? Does it depend, you know, as, as uh, we had Samson of Sons in our neighborhood? It was apparently a community project. Who will raise the child and so on? But this institution is certainly on the books. Ravia says, not quite as we would think. This only applies to a young child who comes before the court himself or herself and says, I would like to be a Jew. So the one-year-old baby in Sans doesn't have a shot in Germany. Not the two-year-old, not the three-year-old. Perhaps a very bright nine or 10 or 11-year-old, but only in such a case is it possible to convert that child as a ger katan, according to this sugya. In all of the cases, it's null and void. He has an interesting brief phrase, she'en yadamt kefa, which as I'll talk about in a moment, means that this would only work more broadly in a Jewish society where Jewish society controls itself. But for now, you must limit this phenomenon in a very drastic way. Just one or two other German examples, and we'll wrap it all up. Um, Sefer Asufot, a student of Ravia, an anonymous work, uh, by a student of Ravia, has a whole section on the laws of Milav, circumcision, and he then has a whole section on conversion of Gerim. Again, he quotes the Talmud, but in the second line he says um, that we must dissuade the convert and tell the convert about the downtrodden nature of the Jewish people. And certainly now, when it's very dangerous, we don't do conversions. And the question remains, is he giving us a standard menu because this is a work of Jewish law and this is one of the topics, and they really weren't doing conversion at this point in Germany at all? Or is he saying that because it's the authorities who are stopping us, I will say for the record, let's not, but if somebody comes forward and survives the process, they'll be okay? Clearly, though, this is obviously a very constricting type of an approach. Um, let me, uh, um, I, I think now we can start to try to compare and contrast why these things are happening. Let me give you quickly, I'll regal achat, my two explanations for why France and Germany appear to be rather different here at precisely the same time when they are often the same. In this topic, they are very, very different. Two suggestions. One is the issue of yichus, of lineage. And here I'll just refer you to the work of my very distinguished colleague in Jerusalem, Avram Grossman, who's written extensively in several different places about the value of not pure lineage in the completely removed sense, but in valuing Jewish lineage in medieval Ashkenaz. And Grossman argues that this was true for all of Ashkenazic communities in France and in Germany, but the prize goes to the Germans. The German community in the medieval period valued this issue of pure lineage more so than anyone else. 
you already heard the case of the convert who was a martyr. You'll get a big reward, maybe bigger than us, but you'll, and you'll be with all of us in the section for Gerim. Not said quite that nastily, mind you, but it, it's getting there. Um, Re is aware of the Talmudic expression which says that Shechina only appears to Mishpachot Miyuchasot, which doesn't mean there are no Gerim, but a very fine lineage. And he balances it. In Germany, they don't balance. And so what I'm suggesting is that therefore, the German rabbinic authorities are much more hesitant to support conversion going in. If somebody converted, they treated them wonderfully. Even Sefer Asufot, which says we don't do conversion because it's dangerous, says that if somebody succeeds, love them. But pre gerut counseling and guidance and lenience, leniency are not part of the German um, uh, menu. The last point is perhaps, from, to my mind, even the most important, more important point here, and that is, we have, as we, as I'm sure, all most of you know, conversion to Judaism in the medieval period, and in some places beyond, was a very heavily punishable offense. Church legislation, imperial legislation, local clergy, doctrinal material, up and down the line. However. It's only in German rabbinic sources that we have any explicit mention of these threats. I mentioned the Asufot. It's very dangerous now. Sefer Chasidim has a passage where a community tried to go through with a conversion, and they couldn't circumcise the convert because they were afraid. Pachadu b'nei ha'ir. They were afraid. They kind of backed off. We have several other examples of explicit. The mayor of Rothenburg at one point says that only one in a thousand, the, the chance of not being burned at the stake for converting someone to Judaism, one in a thousand, you'll get away with it. Again, he studied in northern France, but this is a German locale where he makes this statement. Um, again, the Orzarua, Eya Adam Tkefa, we can't do these things now. We don't get a single such statement in northern France. Not that I'm sure it was any less punishable according to the law. But no literature from northern France, no rabbinic literature of which I'm aware, mentions in any instance this physical threat and that they're having problems with it. And so what I'm suggesting is that perhaps it is simply or largely a matter of where you live. In Germany, these threats were more keenly felt, and I'll explain why in my last half minute. In France, the threats were there. They were very brave. They had to deal with them, but they were not felt and not recorded in any kind of strong way. The reason for this difference is, and here I just have to refer to research of others, in the late 12th century, the local bishops were in charge of enforcing non-conversion. In the early 13th century, this shifts over to the mendicant friars. And in both cases, we have evidence in Germany for particular closeness of these church men and church officials to the Jews in their area. Jews in Germany were under tighter control by local bishops generally, and this is you know big generalization, but generally so than in northern France. If you go into the 13th century, the friars were more involved community by community with the Jews, and there were all kinds of proximity studies, than they were in northern France. Uh, Jeremy Cohn has written very well about the friars many years ago, but still very, very well, a very important book still, has a case of Bernald of Regensburg, who preached in the vernacular to the Jews and to his people in Regensburg, and it's a very important Jewish community in Regensburg, about the great penalties that will befall anyone who causes Christians to convert, and he warns the Christians not to fall prey. So to wrap it all up, I would like to argue that this distinction can be demonstrated both in theoretical halachic discussion, in Talmudic interpretation, and in practical statements of Jewish law. The manuscript piece that you have before you is just one example of some very practical cases that are found in northern France that do not appear in Germany. I'd like to explain that difference possibly by an internal Jewish consideration of yichus, of lineage, where this consideration plays more strongly in Germany than it does in northern France. And there's a whole bunch of literature and discussion about that. And finally, I'd like to suggest that both in actual practice and in possibility, the ability of the church through its various arms to enforce conversion, anti-conversion penalties and principles and policies 
was much more effective and could be much more effective in Germany and northern France. And hence, we might be dealing, uh, you know, the great thing that all rabbis are told when they're very young, Zainetanar, don't be silly. If there is a problem against, that's what makes a great rabbi. If they, they were told that when they were young. If, if um, I have an authority, if you are, uh, going to do this, you're going to endanger the community. Um, I'll close with one example, uh, the Orzarua, the last name on your list here. We'll end right at the end, uh, sort of almost on time maybe, um, who has a case and his son Chaim Orzarua of a certain Rabbeinu Yitzchak, a great figure. We don't know who it is, but a figure of some moment, Rabbeinu Yitzchak, who was circumcising Geirim in Germany. And at one point, the authorities came and said, we know somebody here is converting Jews, and we want that person. And they blamed someone else. And the rabbis ruled that in this case, if authorities come and say, we want one of you, which one will it be? You cannot favor privilege or dis <laughs> the opposite of privilege one over the other. In this particular case, even though Rabbeinu Yitzchak was doing a great mitzvah, he was doing a great thing, a very courageous thing, he was, in fact, fingered as the one doing this, and there had been an alila, there had been some kind of a libel, whether a blood libel or some other libel, an alila doesn't mean invite you for dinner. And again, this kind of material is found only in German communities. We don't have it in French communities at all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kanner-Fogel. Our next speaker is going to be Tzvi Zohar who is the Chauncey Stillman Professor of Sephardic Law and Ethics at bar -Ilan University, where he teaches in the Faculty of Law and in the Faculty of Jewish Studies. Professor Zohar is a Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of Advanced Judaic Studies in Jerusalem, where he has the Alan A. and Lorraine Fisher Family Center for Contemporary Halakha. He was also a founding faculty member of Paideia, the European Institute for Jewish Studies in Sweden. Professor Zohar is interested in all aspects of Jewish life and thought, especially in modern times. His areas of special research and teaching competence include the sociology, anthropology, and history of Jewish law, and halakha, the culture and creativity of Sephardic Oriental rabbis in modern times, and the history of the Jews of the Middle East in modern times. So we're going to be jumping continents and also a couple of centuries. Professor Zohar. Um, good evening. I'm going to uh, speak about uh, halachic approaches uh, to conversion among Sephardic rabbis in modern times, but I would like to begin, uh, you should have the source text, I would like to begin with two texts from the Rambam from Maimonides uh, to establish the grounds of this approach which the later rabbis themselves link to and relate to Rambam. In general, the ideal ger, the ideal convert, is the ideal Jew. Sincere, devout, observant, intelligence, with a wonderful sense of humor, just the kind of person you would want your daughter to marry, and the conversion ceremony for such a person would and should happen, according to the Rambam, after checking that this person is only coming for the right motivation, and they have no ulterior motives, and they know what they're getting into, and they in, want to have Kabbalat mitzvot, and so on and so forth, then we will go forward with the, the procedure of giyur. But that's, to my mind, less interesting. What is more interesting and more indicative is what are the minimum requirements without which a giyur is going to be invalid? What is and the reason is that bidi avad, the minimum requirements, are the core requirements, and we have a general principle in Jewish law, sha'at adichak kedi avad dame. Under present circumstances, we may start off by applying the bidi avad requirements. In real life, many cases of giyur in modern times happen under pressing circumstances. There already is intermarriage. There already are children. The people are, and it's not 
somebody coming out of the blue, although there are such cases of very admirable people, and therefore these issues of what is the absolute core minimum requirements that would make a valid giyur are of a special interest. And the Rambam, in fact, um, we have two cases in which he relates this. One in the Mishneh Torah. The Mishneh Torah, Rambam places the rules of giyur in the context of Hilchot Isurei Bia, forbidden unions, and in fact he places this just after those chapter, that chapter that deals with the fact that intermarriage between a Jew and a non-Jew is a forbidden union, and at that juncture he specifically inserts Hilchot Giyur. And he says, inter alia, do not even imagine that Samson and that King Solomon married non-Jewish women. Now, why would somebody think such a strange thing of these great men? Well, if you read the Bible, it says it black and white that these men married non-Jewish women. And there's not a hint in the biblical text of any procedure of giyur that ever took place. Rambam says, Think again. What really happened was, and now let's focus for this purpose on King Solomon. In the time of King Solomon, there was a general policy of the Beit Din never to accept any gear for whatever reason. And the women that King Solomon wanted to have converted were coming for all the wrong reasons for a marriage. Furthermore, these women never intended to disassociate themselves from pagan worship, and they continued all throughout the process of Giyur to believe in alien gods, and this later emerged when, in fact, they set up centers for pagan worship in the city of Jerusalem. Nevertheless, says Rambam, since these women went through the basic core procedure of Giyur, they were Jewish. They were sinning Jews. They were pagan Jews. But you, the Afalpi Shechata Yisrael, who these women were therefore Jewish. And it's better, we learn from this context, for a Jewish man to be married to a sinning Jewish, to a Jewess who worships alien gods, than to be in a situation of intermarriage. And he generalizes from that and says in um, paragraph 17, a proselyte, a gear, whose motives were not investigated or is not informed about the commandments and their punishments, meaning they come to the procedure knowing nothing at all about Judaism, but was circumcised and immersed in the presence of three laymen you don't have to be a rabbi. You do have to have a quasi judicial procedure, but it could be head yotot. Is a proselyte. Even if it becomes known that he became a proselyte for some ulterior motive, he has exited from the Gentile group once he was circumcised and immersed. He, Rambam says he should be regarded with reservation, but what this apparently means at most is that we everything else being equal, would not want him to marry into our group because he says that if he once again worships idols, he is an apostate Israelite whose betrothal is valid. In fact, this Talmudic text where we learn that a person who converted and immediately afterwards reverted to pagan behavior and then betrothed the Jewish woman, or vice versa, a non-Jewish woman who went through this procedure, and then was, had kiddushin with a Jewish man, the kiddushin are valid. This is the case where we learn that such is also for a Jew by birth. And we are commanded to return his lost property to him. Okay, the mitzvah, I say the positive commandment of returning a lost property applies to this person, therefore his con their conversion is not in doubt. Therefore, Shimshon and King Solomon were validly married to 
halachically Jewish women, albeit women who had no information at all about Torah and mitzvot before their conversion, their motivation was very poor and was not even checked into because Shlomo knew what the result would be. And that is the minimum core possibility of giyur. Furthermore, in a responsum of the Rambam, which you have on the next page, he discusses a young man, a young Jewish man, who bought a young female slave on the slave market. Okay, we're talking about the framework of slavery which existed throughout the ancient world in the medieval times. And it was later rumored that he was having relations with her, sexual intimate relations. And the community in which this person resided asked the Rambam, what should we do? And the Rambam says, well, you can't let this kind of thing go on. There should be a choice to this young man. Either he sells her back on the slave market or he frees her and releases her, whereupon a person who is in that status of Evit Kanani, Shifcha Kanani, becomes Jewish, and then he marries her. In fact, says the Rambam, the second solution for him to free her and for them to get married, and now they're a fine Jewish couple, is the preferred solution, and I have ruled such in previous instances that came to my attention. True, says the Rambam, for them to get married, we would have to go against an explicit Mishnah, which says that if a Jewish man was suspected of having sexual relations with a non-Jewish woman, and she later converted, she is now unquestionably a Jewess, but she should please marry somebody else and not him. So, Ramam says, it's true. The Mishnah says that. However, in such cases, we overrule the Mishnah. We don't follow the Mishnah. We encourage the persons to get married as man and wife afterwards. And the reasons we do this, and here he brings in a very strong array of reasons, um, for instance, takanat hashavim, the encouragement of penitence, okay, which in the Mishnah we find uh, rabbis uh, 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 made certain uh, permissions for a person who wants to be about teshuvah, to repent from a certain sin. The rabbis enabled them to do so, even cutting corners in other existing halachot. Here, too, a person who is intermarried and wants to have their partner converted in this matter is a Baal Teshuvah. A Baal Teshuvah doesn't mean an all or nothing situation. You are observing nothing, now you're observing 100%. On this matter, this person wants to repent. They want to have a Jewish family. Both couples will be Jewish. We, the rabbis, it's our obligation, mipenei takanat shavim, to enable them to convert and to marry. Another consideration um, taken from Yom Kippur and rules of forbidden food, he should eat rather eat gravy than the fat itself, meaning we follow the principle of the lesser evil. It's not an ideal giyur. Ideally, we would not want such a giyur, but given the alternative, meaning that there will continue a state of intermarriage, which is very negative from the halachic and Jewish perspective, given that the lesser evil is giyur, although we know the motivation is a problem, although we know that until now these people haven't been living such a devout life. And furthermore, says the Rambam, we also apply the principle it is time to act for the Lord. They have made void thy Torah. Et la asot la Hashem heferu Torah techa, which in halachic framework is sort of like a nuclear weapon, okay? Because it means for the sake of doing what is right in the eyes of God, we can directly act against Torah. And the Ram says that's what we're also doing here. Fast forward to the 19th century, unlike um, medieval times, which Professor Confolia has described so clearly, in modern times, 
there was no restrictions or in many modern countries in, in Europe and elsewhere, there were no restrictions on a person choosing Giyur. The authorities didn't mix in to prevent that. There were also no restrictions de facto on intermarriage. There was civil marriage. There were people living together in wedlock or out of wedlock were mixed couples. So the question raised itself in modern times, given the fact that we have many, many cases of intermarriage, and given the fact that Giyur is permitted by the authorities of the countries in which Jews live, would it be a good idea to solve intermarriage by Giyur? OK? And, um, here we have three cases. One is Rabbi Eliyahu Hazan. Rabbi Eliyahu Hazan was born in Izmir, grew up in Jerusalem, where he studied under his grandfather, who was the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, Haim David Hazan. And later, he became the chief rabbi of uh, Tripoli in Libya, and then the chief rabbi of Alexandria in Egypt was a very important Jewish community and was at that time, late 19th and early 20th century, under British rule, because British had conquered Egypt. And he was asked, with regard to the case of community leader who had been living for many years in a conjugal relationship with a non-Jewish woman, Rama Hazan replied that that woman could undergo giyur and then marry her spouse in a Jewish wedding, for it is better that she live with him in a permitted relationship than a forbidden one. And when challenged to justify his decision, Rama Hazan said, that he is relying upon the tshuva, the responsum of the Rambam, with that young woman and the young, attractive slave girl. And he said, Kalva Homer, if that is what our master wrote at that time, when Jewish courts were strong and powerful, Jewish community authority was strong and powerful, nevertheless, he did not force a divorce or a disconnect, rather encourage them to have gear and then stay in their relationship under Jewish marriage, what else can we answer and say in our generation and the lands of freedom and liberty in this country ruled by the French? Here he was referring to Algeria, where that case had happened. And uh, later when he arrived in Alexandria, he was asked about such further cases. And he says that if a Jewish man living with a non-Jewish woman and they have children together applies for her and her children to undergo giyur, it is right to accept them and for, perform giyur for them. It is better that she be with him in a permitted status than in a forbidden status. And taking a phrase from the Talmud about a, uh, a woman uh, who uh, converted uh, to Judaism, Okay, he says in Hebrew, Ra'ui le kablam u le gayeram, u mutav shetietz lo beheter ve lo be isu. She should be with him in a permitted fashion. She is now Jewish. He is Jewish. They could live together as Jewish man and wife. U matzaot she utzah lo be isu, tatzia lo beheter. She will now, the bed, the married bed, will be one of permissive. Ve habanim asher teled achar hagiur, hem kesherim gemurim. If they now have children, these children will now be Jewish by birth. Kasher katavnu bi teshuva acheret, as we wrote in a different responsum, v'samachnu al teshuvat ha-Rambam zal, and we rely upon the decision of the Rambam. Um, Rabbi Ben Zion Meir Hay Uziel, who passed away in 1953 and was the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, he was born and bred in the old city of Jerusalem. His father was a Dayan of the community there. Uziel family is a very old family hailing back to the pre-Spanish expulsion. Okay, and in the early 1920s, he served a brief stint of two and a half years as the chief rabbi of Salonika in Greece, uh, where he was asked with regard to a Jew who married a non-Jewish woman and had children with her a, should the wife and children be accepted for giyur, although their motivation was clearly not a religious motivation? 
He said, yes. Okay, second question. Could the couple then marry under Jewish law despite the prohibition stated in the Mishnah that a person who had a previous relationship when uh, the woman or the man wasn't Jewish, now the giur is valid, but the convert should marry somebody else? And Rabbi Uziel said, yes. The couple, after she converts, can marry a, a Jewish marriage. And he quoted the Rambam's responsum and he said, these precious words of his are our guide. For if we shall not permit her marriage to whom after Giyur, they will remain their entire lives in intermarriage. Let's not fool ourselves. There's consequences if we accept people for Giyur, but there's also consequences if we don't accept them for Giyur. The rabbis bear responsibility for both situations. The rabbis bear responsibility not only for ensuring that the giur is valid, but also for making sure that by denying giur, they are not, in fact, pushing people away and disconnecting even more and remaining in intermarriage. So it's up to the rabbis to decide which responsibility are they taking and he says, if we shall not permit her marriage to him after Giyur, there won't be any Giyur, because it's a package deal. Why is she getting Giyur so that she could then stay together with her husband as a Jewish wife, and their children will have Giyur and will be Jewish children? But if we don't do that, they will remain their entire lives in intermarriage, and their offspring will be children of that mixture uprooted from the soil of Israel, meaning Although the father is Jewish and the mother is non-Jewish, technically speaking, the children are not Jewish according to halakha. We, says Rabbi Uziel, have a responsibility to try to include those children in. And we can do that if we accept their mother and them for giyur because the fact that a person has a Jewish father puts them on our radar as persons that we are responsible for. Okay. So first, uh, I'll read the two sections in Hebrew that are in bold with regard to the acceptance for your mitzvah alehem on the rabbis, lekarvam, to bring near these people, ulachnisam bivrit Torah Yisrael, ulehotzi nega hataarovet. By doing this, the rabbis will be able to overcome the problems of intermarriage because once there's giyur, that couple is no longer intermarried. Further, he says, can they then get married afterwards? Yes, he says, we follow the guidance of Rambam. Okay. She'im lo natir nisu'eha ima, nisu'a imo, should be achrei geruta, yisha'aru nisu'im kol yemehem begeruta, they will stay remaining in an intermarriage. Ubinehem yu ta'arovot ne'akarim me'adimat Yisrael. And this is something that we rabbis have to take responsibility to overcome, and we can do that by enabling giyur. Uh, finally, the third case, which is my last case, uh, is Rabbi Moshe HaKohen of Jerba. Jerba is an island off the coast of Tunisia. Um, was the frumest place in North Africa. Okay, you couldn't get more from than Jerba. Jerba effectively barred the entrance of Allianz schools because they were afraid of the influence of those schools on the religiosity of the children. Rabbi Moshe Kohen, who was a rabbi of, the chief rabbi of one of the two communities in Jerba, moved to Israel in 1958 and served as a Dayan in Tiberias. He passed away in 1966, so we know that this case that he's talking about, or this issue, is an issue that he says he faced in Israel. It's sometime between 1958 and 1966, let's say, for the purpose of simplicity, 1960. And he says, many Jews married Gentile women after the Second World War and have fathered sons and daughters with them. Many of those people came to Israel after the war. According to the law, 
halacha, the children's status follows that of their Gentile mother. They are not Jewish. When they come to Israel, the husband brings the children for giyur, sometimes with their mother and sometimes on their own. The trouble is that they reside in places in which the people, meaning the Jews, the Israeli Jews, do not observe the tradition. They eat forbidden foods and desecrate the Shabbat and holidays. It is clear that after the giyur, they, if these people, if we do have giyur for them, they will behave similarly to the Jews among whom they live, since it's almost impossible for them to be observant. So let's not fool ourselves. The question is, are we allowed and should we follow a policy of Allah giyur for such families in which we know that the Jewish partner is not observant and that after giyur, in real life, the wife and the children are not going to be from. Rabbi Moshe Akohin, prima facie at first glance, said nothing doing. Since we know that these people are not going to be observant, we cannot accept them for giyur. However, he then reconsidered. And why did he reconsider? Because he reread very carefully the section from Mishneh Torah that I read with you about the wives of Solomon. And he says it's obvious that observe Kabbalat mitzvot that we require cannot mean an intention to observe the mitzvot. Obviously, the wives of Shimshon and Shlomo did not have that intention. They were before and after believing in Avodah Zarah, in pagan worship. So the meaning of Kabbalat mitzvot that we accept from Agir has to be something else. And therefore, he writes, accepting commandments does not mean that he must commit himself to observe all the commandments. Rather, it means that he accepts all the commandments of the Torah in the sense that if he transgresses, he will be liable for such punishment as he deserves. And so, we do not care if at the time he that he accepts the commandments, he intends to transgress a particular commandment and accept the punishment. This is not considered a flaw in his acceptance of commandments. What bearing does this have on the issue at hand? He says, what we do want to know is, and now we're going to the last page, we do want to know that this person sincerely intends to become Jewish. Sincere intention to become Jewish and sincere intention to become from is not the same thing. And he says, okay, in Hebrew, of the convert, Yisrael. And we have to have some indication that this person actually sees themselves as having joined the Jewish people. They have to behave afterwards Jewishly in a way that we could note is Jewish, although it may not be from Jewish. And he says the same thing must have happened with the wives of Shlomo and Shimshon, right? They didn't believe that in monotheism, because they also believed in Avodah Zarah, but they must have done some other thing. Maybe they lit the Shabbos candles, right? So, Okay, but they are Jewish. And then he says, let's look at these women, these non-Jewish women who are now living in Israel as part of an intermarried couple in Israeli secular society. In our time, the great majority of non-Jewish women who undergo giyur were behaving in several matters as Jewesses even before their giyur, from the time they married their Jewish husbands. Why? Because everybody in Israel has a Seder Pesach. Okay? Almost everybody in Israel uh, uh, fasts or refrains from doing certain things on Yom Kippur. Almost everybody in Israel has a brit milah for their children. Okay? There's a wonderful book, highly recommended by Professor Asher Cohen, of Bar Ilan University called Yehudim Lo Yehudim, okay? Jewish non-Jews, 
okay, in which he does field research about people who came to Israel from the former Soviet Union. And he begins this book with a wonderful story. The story is that a uh, certain uh, gentleman who he had been in contact with for some time, Sasha, says, calls him up. He says, look, Asher, my son had a baby. And we're going to have a bris. I want to say some few words at the bris. Now, it's true everybody there is going to understand Russian. But I feel since we're now living in Israel, I should say these words in Hebrew. Could you please help me? And Asher Cohen says that in the book, okay, that he was frankly very surprised because he knew that Sasha's wife was non-Jewish. Their sons were non-Jewish, technically, halachically. They had married women who were also in that same status. And therefore, this grandchild was not Jewish according to halacha. But it didn't even cross any of these people's minds not to have a breed. Everybody has a breed. OK, so he says, therefore, getting back to Israel, this time in 1960, since non-Jewish people who are involved in intermarriage frequently do a lot of things that are Jewish, by the way, I'm told by some people I know in the reform movement that a lot of non-Jewish people attend services and participate in many other ways in Jewish life. Now, let's say such a person wants to have giyur. Okay, they're already doing things. And therefore, according to the above, says Rabbi Moshe HaKohen, such women should be accepted for giyur to save the Jewish husband some sincere transgressions entailed by intermarriage and to save the children that will be born to them and to perform gear for those children already born to them to bring the entire family under the wings of the Shekhinah so that none of us be banished. The wings of the Shekhinah are broad enough to encompass converts in the cases of intermarried families who are not going to be from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zohar. Our final speaker is Professor Aryeh Drey, who is a professor of law at Tel Aviv University. His main fields of interest are Talmudic jurisprudence and Jewish law in the 20th century. Professor Drey earns an LLB, LLM, and PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and did postdoctoral work as a Harry Starr Fellow at the Center for Jewish Studies at Harvard University. <coughs> he has served as a visiting professor at the University of Toronto Law School, Cardozo Law School, and most recently as the Gruss Professor of Talmudic Law at the University of Pennsylvania. He was also a Senior Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 2005. And Professor Jay will be using a, a PowerPoint um, presentation rather than a handout, so um, you should pay attention to that. Thanks. I feel that I need to apologize for having a PowerPoint because it caused so much misunderstanding around here during the talk. Um, I should have prepared the handout, but I tried to be smarter and I was punished. So I'm sorry. Um, I'll probably start with Svi, um, where Professor Zor ended. I'll start where Professor Zor ended. Um, the Russian Jews in Israel today, or the Russian non-Jews in Israel today, and the question of Giyur caused tremendous debate and misunderstanding and I would say a hated debate, debate in Israel. Many, many rabbis try to initiate a conversion for those Jews and help them assimilate into the Jewish community while many other rabbis try to prevent that process and are very much against it. It brought the case of conversions and annulling conversions. It came to the Supreme Rabbinical Court and from the Supreme Rabbinical Court, like anything in Israel, to the Supreme Court and so forth. Um, I want to look at the historical roots of this, of this debate where it comes from. Now, 
Talmudic sources about conversion, if you read them carefully, or even if you just go through, there is, a, there is an ambiguity about what exactly giur is, what exactly conversion is, and how exactly it should be done. And that ambiguity continues to Maimonides. Now, ambiguities in Talmud is something that we used to. This is part of the thing. This is what it is about. Maimonides tries to be clear. When he has ambiguities, he probably has a reason. Now, we just heard from, from Professor Zohar the beautiful story of Maimonides in, when he talks about Giyur with the wives of Shimshon and Shlomo, but, which is, of course, the question, why does Maimonides in his law talk about those stories? It's a law, not a story, but that's, that's another story. But these stories come in between two chapters, chapter 13 and chapter 14, which again, if you read them carefully, you'll get confused about what exactly Giyur is according to Maimonides and how it exactly should be conducted according to Maimonides. Now, it is clear from the Talmud and so from Maimonides that, and the Talmud says this explicitly, that there are two aspects of Giyur, joining the community and joining the religion. Those two aspects come together and you cannot distinguish between them. It's impossible in Jewish tradition to distinguish between the, the community and the religion. You cannot, be, you cannot join the religion and remain within a, another community or vice versa. It is clear from the Talmud that the conversion has two aspects of some bodily process and some mental process. There is a circumcision and an immersion, and there is a mental process. It is clear. But there is some ambiguities with regard to the mental process, to the awareness, to the intent. What exactly do we require? What exactly do we expect? And those ambiguities lies on, one, the motivation. What should be the motivation when the Talmud says explicitly that if the motivation is the wrong motivation, this is not good. Although maybe it will be valid conversion, but shouldn't be done. And the wrong motivation, according to the Talmud, is when you join Judaism, not because you want to be Jewish, but let's say because you want to marry a Jewish woman, or because you expect some other um, benefits from it. The other, the other side of intent or awareness, the mental part of conversion, which is not so clear in the Talmud, is the idea of accepting the yoke, accepting the mitzvot. The Talmud, surprisingly, you might think, or not, doesn't talk so clearly about what is that exactly. It talks about modi'inoto, we inform him the mitzvot. The Talmud talks about we inform him some of the mitzvot. We inform him the punishments. We inform him the rewards. It is not exactly so clear. It might be, it might be that it's not necessarily so clear because maybe um, at ancient times, once you joined the Jewish community and you're there, it was quite obvious what you're doing, you do what everyone is doing. Maybe that's the reason, at least in later generations, this could be the explanation. But in modern time, and this is where I think the problem, the real issues start in modern time, when we have new phenomena, new um, types, I would say, or new characters of Jews. A, a Jewish character that he will not fully know previously. The level of his um, commitment to mitzvot 
is somewhat diverse, different levels. The religion lost its power. Civil marriage is an option. Some places it's already, it's already must, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law, civil marriage. Society is open. Jews meet other, meet, meet non-Jews. The walls between societies collapsed. Jews have options where to live, employment uh, um, opportunities, and so on and so on, which brought with itself the possibility of intermarriage. Intermarriage in medieval Europe could not happen. You had to marry within your faith. So if the non-Jew wanted to marry a Jew, one of them had to convert. Otherwise, they could not marry. In modern time, after emancipation, it is a possibility for mixed marriage. So now, um, the married couple and this is the new phenomenon, the new issue. The married couple come together. They are married. And they, together, come and say, we want to join the Jewish community. And this is the easy part, I would say, of the, of the story. But the more difficult part of the story is that it's clear to everyone that this couple this Jew and non-Jew that are married outside of the religion, outside of the community, this couple is living not exactly as a traditional Jewish family. And now they want to join the community for certain reasons, and they might be committed to some extent Jewish, to some Jewish rituals or lifestyles, but basically they are not going to change significantly their lifestyle. And the question is, should we let them in? That's the question. And now, contrary to medieval time, which we heard from Professor Karnafogel, how hard he has to dig in order to find an example here and there, when it comes to modern time, because of the reason which I just mentioned, there are so many sources. And I want to, um, I want to um, look at few sources which I think identify the debate. And I think looking at conversion in modern time and the debate between the rabbis in 19th century and later on 20th century, the debate between the rabbis on the issue on conversions is a window into understanding what's going on in Jewish society at that period of time. The debates or the confusion of how to understand the fact that the, co that the community is no longer one community, is no longer um, hom um, homogeneous. It's not one community, the same, the same thing, but, right, but, but rather a fragmented community. So let's look at the first slide that we have in, our, um, in front of us. And this is um, a question that was sent to Rabbi Shlomo Kluger. Now, um, Rabbi Kluger, um, as you can see, is um, from 1785 to 1869. And at the time that he writes this letter, he is the Magid and the, and the Dayan in Brod, in Eastern Galicia. So it's basically around the middle 19th century. And he gets a letter. Uh, from a rabbi in a, in a, in a local, in, a, in another town, that he, this, this other rabbi, got a letter from a rabbi in Germany asking the question. And the question is, he says, a question posed to me, in Germany and France, where the new law exists, the new law exists. It's not yet in Galicia, but it's, it's in, in Germany and France. The new law exists, meaning, meaning a Jew can marry a non-Jew. Mixed marriage are, is possibility by law. And there was an episode in which a person's son was a soldier and intermingled with non-Jew, and he fell in love and then returned with her to his father's house 
and her intent is to convert. They want to know if I agree. Now, um, Kluger is a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he knows what's going on in Germany. Uh, he knows the changing of the status of the Jews out there. But even though, despite that, I think, he still don't fully understand what's going on because he is aware of the fact that there is a new law that mixed marriage is a possibility, but he still says, and look at this paragraph in, in, in slide number two, he says, I don't believe that according to new law, you even allowed to convert, right? He doesn't believe. So everything he's going to say from here on is under assuming that you are allowed to convert according to the law, but he's not fully sure um, that it, it, it can really be. So in his response, Rabbi Kluger is dealing with the Talmudic concept of motivation. Someone is converting when his motivation is for the, for the marriage, for the sake of marriage. And his idea on his, or his innovative claim is that if someone is already married, you cannot say that his motivation for conversion is to marry. He is married already. So why is, why is converting? He's probably converting because he really wants to be a Jew. Because if the reason is for marriage, this is what's true before the new law. But now we have a new law. You don't need to convert in order to marry. Okay? But finally he says, I don't need that. Because, and then he says, let's go to slide number three. He says, since he is flightly, you know, he's going with a non-Jewish girl. And if we don't permit it, he will return with her to her religion, which is close to apostasy. So, and now you would say what? He wants, he might become a Christian, so he says, so the fact that he did not convert and stayed at her place, but rather they returned to his father's house proves that she wants to convert for the sake of heaven and not because of men. And therefore, it is permitted to accept her and convert her. And then in the next slide, in after the rabbi that got the letter was amazed from this uh, idea, and he uh, appealed uh, and tried to challenge the rabbi, so uh, Rabbi Kluger. So Rabbi Kluger keeps on and, and telling him, um, for if he wanted to, he could convert from Judaism and remain in the local of the gentle woman who forced him to come to his father's house. And even now, he can still return and convert. So since he wants to be Jew and for her to convert, it proves that, that their intent is for the sake of heaven. So look, what happened here at Kluger's response is that he says that in Talmudic time, if someone converts for marriage, it proves that the motivation is a bad motivation because you convert only because you want to marry. In our times, it's the opposite, he says. If you convert because of marriage, it means that you really want to be a Jew because you have two options. So the two options proves that you really want to become a Jew. So Kluger puts his finger on the essence of modernity. And the essence of modernity is freedom of choice. This is the, he puts his finger on that. And he says, he has a choice and he chose to be a Jew. So he wants to be a Jew. Um, now, uh, And, and, uh, okay, now, um, so, so, so as I said, what tipped the scales in his mind is the freedom of choice and the fact that they chose to join the Jewish community. 
Now, if you, so this response is a very important response, which everyone later on quotes, becomes like a cornerstone in the debate until today. Now, in the other side, geographically not far from there, from where he writes this letter, approximately 45 years later, there is another response by Rabbi Schmelkes. Rabbi Schmelkes is, uh, again, a, a leading, a leading uh, scholar, a leading rabbi of the period, a shoot bet Yitzchak, and he lives, and he writes this letter 45, uh, 45, 45 years later, completely the, to the extreme, uh, extreme uh, other, other side, and, and he says the following. We are slide number five, right? So with regard, he, he's around Lvov, Lemberg. And it's important, Broad versus Lemberg, I'll, I'll, I'll save you words about it in a few moments. So he talks about a situation where um, someone were regarding a person who had a child with a gentle maid. And his wife died, and now he wants to marry the gentile after she converts. And if we do not permit this, he will live with her in, a, in sin, or will marry her in civil marriage. So the question is, shall we allow this marriage? So he says, in, in, uh, in slide number six, in such a case, do we permit him to do so in order to prevent him from serious transgression? Or is it the court, or is it the court not permitted to go so, to do so, since we know for sure that even after conversion, she will not observe the laws of family purity, and also because the conversion itself is only for the purpose of marrying? That's exactly, he puts the finger again, that's the question, and again, he um, deals at length with the Talmudic sources and, uh, and the Talmudic sources that were mentioned by, by Professor Zohar that, that Maimonides deal with in his, in his responsa. And even though uh, that the Talmud says that such marriage would be effective or such conversion will be valid ex post facto, according to the Talmudic. So he has, because we're talking about a gentle maid or slave that were, was in his house, so he has a Talmudic source to hold on and be lenient and say, yes, the Talmud itself said in such case that, you, that ex post facto you should do that. And Maimonides said, as we heard from Professor Zohar, that you should do it you should do it also lechatchila. So let's follow that. But Schmelke says no. We should distinguish between the Talmud period and our period. Why? Because, and slide number seven, because he said in the Talmud period, since they converted and accepted the yoke of commandments upon themselves, it is assumed that despite the duress, they accepted the commandments. So basically what it means, if someone converted in Talmudic period, according to Schmelkes, whether it is imagination or whether this, whether this is the real reality of Talmudic period, we don't know, but that's how we understand the Talmud period. In Talmudic period, when you convert, you join the Jewish community, and whether you were serious about accepting the mitzvot while you converted or not, this is what's going to happen. You join the community. If you're Jewish in medieval period in Jew and you live in a Jewish neighborhood, you can't open your store on Shabbat and you can't do you live, you live like any other Jew. But he says, in our time, everything is completely different. And let's look at uh, slide number eight, he says, and I'll maybe read only half, uh, and in the middle, and accordingly, in our generation, says Schmelkes, through our many transgressions, they convert people in Germany knowing that after the conversion, they will not conduct themselves in the proper Jewish manner. Such a person is not a convert, even though she said she's accepted everything 
as they taught her to lie in the conversion process to say that she accepted it, tell that you accept everything, but they actually taught her to lie. So what's happening here? Kluger and Schmelkes, each one of them is putting a finger on, on the essence of the changing circumstances. Schmelke, uh, Kluger, as we said, on the fact that a person now has a freedom of choice and he chose to be a Jew. Schmelkes puts his finger on another point, on another essence of modern, of modern time. Jews, many Jews, no longer observe the mitzvot. Joining the Jewish community doesn't mean anything about how, what is going to be your lifestyle, contrary to the previous time. If you join the Jewish community, we didn't have to be so clear in the process of conversion about accepting the mitzvot. Because once you join the community, your children will go to Jewish school. They will le learn the Jewish curriculum. You, you live among, you'll do what everyone is doing. Now it's different. So each one of them is putting his finger on the other side of the story. And the question, the real question is, how to decide between these competing values and between those competing circumstances? How, how are we going to decide here? Of course, the historical fascinating question is, why? each one of them chose to put his finger on one side of the story and ignore the other side of the story. That's a fascinating story. Now, you might think that, you might think, or you might have the image in front of yourself now by, uh, after hearing me for a few minutes, that Kluger is smiling face, very lenient and nice rabbi, contrary to Schmelkes, who is, you know, as, well, I'm, I want to tell you that this is not a story. Kluger is known for his battles against any little change in traditional life in his community. He conducting battles if that if you read them today, you would say, I mean, what is the difference and what is the matter? And, but he wouldn't allow any little change in the way of traditional Jewish life in his community. And here, all of a sudden, in the question that we think is the question, he's all of a sudden very lenient. So we can um, suggest an answer and I want to suggest an answer, but I want to tell before I suggest the answer that what is the answer is not so important because what important is that we have those two sources in front of us. And late and from now on, have all the rabbis that deal with the question, they choose whom they want to quote. They want to quote Kluger or they want to, to quote Schmelkes. And each one has a reason why he wants to, which source he wants to hold to. And the historical reasons why Kluger wrote what he wrote is no longer relevant to the current debate. So the reason that I am, what I am suggest, suggesting is, if you look carefully in broad at Kluger's time, this is not Germany, this is not France, this is Galicia. And at the time, at the time of, of, uh, of Kluger, the community is still one homogenic community. There are voices of the elite enlighteners. The elite enlighteners, they want changes in the law, but they're coming from within, not from without. They're not, they're not enlighteners that want to break the rule of the game. They say, according to the Talmud, we are allowed to do this. Let's do that. They're suggesting minor changes with claims from inside. And he is afraid. Where are they heading to? But he still, but he still has the power of the community. He doesn't dream. He doesn't have in mind the collapse of the community. The fragmentation of the community 
he doesn't have in mind. 50 years later, in Lvov, where Schmelkes is functioning, he has it in mind. This is what's happening. In, in, in the terms that already at Kluger's time exist in Western Europe, Kluger is an orthodox, or maybe ultra-orthodox. But he doesn't know it yet, because orthodoxy doesn't exist in Eastern Europe. It's not, it's not relevant there. 50 years later, the, the, the Eastern European version of orthodoxy, the Machzike Hadat, this is where it's happening in Lvov. This is where it is being created and established. And this is exactly there. So that might be, that might be the, uh, the difference. Now, um, so Kluger wants to keep the community one whole community. This is a traditional Jewish value. While, while Schmelkes understands basing himself on traditional Jewish values, other traditional Jewish values, but he understands that keeping the community as a whole is no longer an option. The community is fragmented. And now the question, what are we doing? And we need to keep what we can keep. And that's why we will not allow in other people that are not going uh, to observe, enjoy, join what we believe should the Jewish community look like. Now, if I want to, um, they tell me that I have only five more minutes. I don't know how it happened, but that's what happened to us all always. Um, um, let's look at uh, slide number nine, and I'm moving to Rabbi Kalisher. And Rabbi Kalisher, and I have to go fast, this is a fascinating question, because Rabbi Kalisher lives in northern Poland, uh, what is now northern Poland at the time was part of Germany, and he responds, this letter, he responds in 1965, 1965, 1865, 1865 is an important year here in, here in America, and he actually writes the letter to America. He received a letter from New Orleans in 1865 about a rabbi that has in his community, or in his town, many intermarriage, Jews, non Jews and non-Jews, and the Jewish fathers the Jewish fathers want to circumcise their children. The mother agrees, but she disagrees to tvila, to, um, to immersion. She disagrees to immersion. So she disagrees for conversion, but circumcision is okay. The rabbi of New Orleans refused to circumcise them. And he tells the moel, don't you dare. Why? They're not Jews. You're not allowed to, to circumcise them. So they write to Kalisher. The Kalisher says, not only that you are allowed to, con to circumcise them, please do it. It's a great mitzvah. Why? Now you ask me, why do I bring this letter of Kalisher? He's not talking about conversion. Nobody's talking about in, in, this letter, in this letter about conversion. The mother doesn't agree for conversion. But Kalisher says, you know what? He's, he's a Jew. His father is Jewish. We want to keep him in the Jewish community. Halachically, he's not Jewish, but he, instead of calling him a non-Jew, he calls him a lost Jew. It's a little change in terminology, but it's a lost Jew. If it's a lost Jew, let's try to get him in. How will we get him in? He's a baby, we can't get him in. But we should hope that when he grow up, he will come back. If you will circumcise him now as a baby, it's very easy to convert. When you, when you are an adult, it's frightening. Many people don't convert because they're afraid from, from circumcision. So he tells him, so he tells him, please circumcise him in, in order that he will come back. So what's happening here? 
is that um, um, <clears throat> we have here a completely, a 19th century, a completely new character of a convert. It's not a non-Jew that knocks on our door and says, I'm a non-Jew, I want to become a Jew. But it's someone who knocks on our door and says, you know, all my family is Jewish. I want to join them. My wife is Jewish. My husband is Jewish. My father is Jewish. I want to join the Jewish community. I want to be with my family. This is a completely new phenomenon. And on the other hand, the Pusek, the rabbi, has to worry not only about this specific person who wants to convert, but because he's part of a family, he has to worry about the entire family, the Jewish family. What will happen to them? What will happen to them if he will not convert? So they will probably, as a family, will be outside. Now, I understand that they have to finish, right? So um, I, will, I, will, I will just say that there is a similarity here between how do you relate to Giyur and how do you relate to the big question of Jewish existence in modern time when many Jews, or maybe most Jews, are not observant anymore? And how do you understand what the concept of Klal Israel is and what the concept of a Jewish community or the Jewish people is? What is it? Those who want to say it is a lost concept, we just should close ourselves into our what was the traditional Jewish way of life and stick that there, they will close the gate for conversion in that period because it's not the traditional conversion. Those who say we should find ways to include everyone in and to define the Jewish community in despite the fact that we believe that this is wrong and we believe in following the tradition, but we should find some ways to include everyone and to define the Jewish community in a way that everyone is in would also welcome the conversion in order to keep the entire Jewish family within the Jewish community. Now, you might be not surprised if that, if that is the case to hear that if you will try to make and to analyze who is between the poskim, who is in which side, you will find a very interesting similarity between the rabbis who are supporting the giur, like Kalisher, like, like uh, well, Kluger is earlier, but like, like like Kalisher, like Glasner, and many others, and their support to the idea of Zionism. And those who are against the Giyur, and they are against the idea of Zionism. Because basically the idea of Zionism was to try to initiate a new way to define the Jewish community based on national concepts. And basically, although these rabbis don't say it explicitly, but they're paving the way for giyur, for a religious giyur, by religious traditional um, um, characters, but basically, some, to some extent, a national conversion. So I wanted to conclude by the end of time with Rabbi uh, Unterman, the chief rabbi of, uh, of the state of Israel. Do I have time to read this? Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, Okay, with, with Rabbi Unterman, who spoke about, who spoke about the, um, the immigrants from Russia, who spoke about the immigrants from Russia, not in the last wave that we are talking now, but in the earliest wave, in the, middle, in the, in the 70s. First wave of the, and Rabbi, now Rabbi Unterman was a, a Litvakish rabbi, you know, he came from, from Lithuania, or from Poland, Basically, he was, he was uh, ordained by, by Chaim Rosa Grudzinski, the chief rabbi of Vilna. And, but he was still in Poland, a, a great, uh, maybe the greatest, one of the greatest supporters of the Zionist movement. 
and then became a rabbi in, of, in England, and, that, and that, that's, that's how he um, escaped the, the Holocaust. And then, um, uh, late 60s, he became the chief rabbi of Israel. And he talks at length about, about how important it is in our days to help all the immigrants the family members of the Jewish immigrants, the family, the non-Jewish family members that came to Israel, how it is important to help them and be lenient and show nice face to them and welcome them into the Jewish community. Basically, he understands now <coughs> state of Israel coming, choosing again to live in the state of Israel is a or the new Jewish community, right, which choosing to live there and be part of that is basically cho choosing to be a Jew and we should welcome it. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists um, for such rich and wonderful presentations. Um, so rich that we have to cut them off. We're going to open um, to questions and answers and extend our time. So I'd like to invite the panelists to please uh, come back. And uh, in the interest of having time for the audience to ask questions, I'm going to sort of hold back my own questions and just point out um, how surveying the theme of conversion was just such an interesting theme over hundreds of years and over different geographic regions has, has yielded such interesting distinctions in evolution and how, um, how important the time and place was in determining what we've seen here. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to the audience, please. Maybe we should, Anna Fogel, it's a hard name. Anna Fogel, it's easier. Go ahead, I know who I am, go ahead. Moshe Cohen in this Crusade Chronicle, right? Uh huh. And he said that you would be with us. Right. You would be with us, but you'll be with them. And them was Right. Not a bad person to be with. No, no, no. Wait, percent. Professor Cannervogel, not everyone can hear. Oh. Can you just summarize the question, the question while we. Essentially, a very good question was according to the. Uh, uh, rabbinic authority at the time, or the rabbinic figure at the time of the First Crusade, where he tells a potential martyr who was a convert, a gear, uh, if you go undergo martyrdom, you will get a very lofty reward with all of us. And he then goes on to say, but you will, you will be also, or you will be with the other righteous converts in some, what seems to be a separate way. So the gentleman's question was, uh, as a convert, you will be the son of Abraham. You will be in that Right. And that is what he said. Right. So the, the question is, being with Avraham is the quintessential good Jewish lineage. That's, that's great yichus. Except to say, you're right, except to say that Avhamon Goyim, Avraham in that sense, is the father of many righteous people, not only amongst the Jewish people. And even if we'll take it just as you suggest, it, that's the whole point. It's still being put forward as a somewhat separate category. That's what I called it, equal but separate. In other words, it, it, you don't need that distinction. Once you raise that distinction, you are leaving this precisely for this kind of analysis. If you, wa if you wanted to say, you'll be with all the Jewish tzaddikim, he knows how to talk English or Hebrew, right? Here he, you know, ca he, he, he um, um, categorizes his categories in this particular way. Again, the problem is not right. The problem is not being a son of Avraham. The problem is that in this context, when it's juxtaposed to something else, not kol hamosiv goreya, he has his... Avraham himself is a convert. Correct. Well, by the way, that's the other point, that Avraham himself came to the Jewish people. That's correct, too. So in any case, it certainly is suggesting a separate, you know, an equal but separate category. Please.
I understand that this question is to me and perhaps also to Professor Adrei. If you believe that that's how divine providence actually works in history after the Holocaust, I don't know who you're talking about. Okay, so anybody today making a consideration about the policy of Giyur on the basis of God is gonna vomit out this or that person because they're not from, that's a big problem. Second of all, maybe the fact that they'll observe certain mitzvot of ahavta l'recha kamocha and not slandering other Jews is more important than if they're gonna be Shomer Shabbos or eating pork. Maybe God has that consideration. Therefore, what the rabbis who are in favor of this, and uh, with great respect for my uh, esteemed colleague, I don't think that the rabbis are doing this because of Zionist motivations. And the rabbis in Chutz Laaretz, like Rav Kluger, and Rav Ephraim Eliyahu Chazan, and others who were doing it all over the world in the 19th and 20th centuries, <laughs> accepting converts who they knew were not gonna be observant. They were doing this because and here I fully agree with Professor Edray, they felt that despite the, uh, the schisms within world Jewry, rabbis have a responsibility for all Jews and not only for the Frum ones, and therefore they have to be especially inclusive of those Jews who have fallen out and married out. Should I, can I, 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 I Professor Edray, yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something. First of all, to, to you three, I never used the word because, and I, and I will not use it. I didn't say they said because they were Zionists. But I said the, the supporting the idea of Zionism and supporting the idea of Giyur are both coming from the same way of thinking, which is understanding what's happening to the Jewish community and feeling responsibility to the entire Jewish community. That's that's a, a and, 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 and to you, I think the situation, you know, I mean, uh, religious life and like everything in life is much more complicated than black and white. And a rabbi, and most rabbi, are serious people, and they take, uh, they, they try to, to, I mean, to value, to balance the, balance what, what, what is on the scale. And, and, and on, on the scale is mixed marriage, losing more people um, marrying outside of Judaism, more and, and so on and so on. And if you balance everything, they decide it's appropriate to allow the people to show nice face to them, to allow them in, and let them assimilate into Jewish community and become like most other Jews today. Yes, please. He's Ashkenazi, he chose Fardi to vote, and I'm vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think it's, I'll leave it to, to Professor Zor. It's certainly what he wants to say. I focused mainly on the 19th century, which is, which is not, not so yet the case in North Africa, in Muslim countries. The problem is not there yet. So that's why I didn't have, I, I, I have less materials in the 19th century from Sephardic, uh, uh, Sephardic area. But now, you know, in Israel that uh, we think some more um, together, so you can see also Sephardi rabbis who try to compete with the Ashkenazi fellows and be, and basically, and, and actually the rabbi who started the, the last huge debate uh, and annulling the conversion of the more lenient courts was a Sephardi rabbi. But, but in general, I think it's absolutely true. Okay, I will say that, um, uh, first of all, I have, dealt in general with the issue of Giyur in the two books which I wrote together with my friend and peer, uh, Professor Avi Sagi, 
and one of these appeared in English called uh, um, Transforming Identity. I do think it is certainly the case that almost all Sephardic rabbis, until they started studying in Haredi Yeshivot, were inclusive. It's not the opposite with regard to Ashkenazic rabbis. There are many leading Ashkenazic rabbis, including the founder of Agudat Israel, that were in favor of a conversion in cases of intermarriage, even when they knew that people weren't going to be from, because they did have, and here I will follow the thesis of, of Professor Edrei, they did have the notion, many Ashkenazic rabbis, of responsibility for all Jews, and not only for the Frum Jews. There was a certain school of thought which began in Eastern Europe and grew in strength in a certain way that said our responsibility and the future of the Jewish people is only with those who are Frum. And we, this definition became so self-evident to them that it seemed self-evident to, to Rabbi Shmelkes that a person who didn't intend to be from, the gear itself could never be intrinsically valid, even ex post facto, but that historically is a tremendous innovation opposed to the Rambam and many other sources. But, but I, I think you know one, one, uh, one little thing should be added here, that the, the nature of the collapse of the community in North Africa and in, and in Western Europe is, a completely, is completely different. In North Africa, even though many Jews were not observing Judaism as they were a few decades before, they didn't rebel against Judaism. It wasn't a break of the community. Maybe this had also to do with how the rabbis related. Well, to the, you know, that's, that, that's, that's might be, but that's, they, were, they were not ideological movements against the rabbis, like the huge movements in Western Europe and, and later on in Eastern Europe. So in, in, in North Africa, and so was the case, and that's, you know, and so was the case in, in Israel in, in the 60s, 70s, and maybe even today, those people who were less from, as you say, they would drive the car on Shabbat, but everyone would come Friday night to Shul, would come to synagogue, everyone, and then would do what he wants. That was the case. This was not the case in Western Europe. So now the question, you know, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Okay, we can debate about it. In the back. Could you just speak up a little bit? Well, speaking for myself, I can tell you that these same people already conduct books of lineage, and therefore it's an empty threat. Because they, anyway, won't marry many other people who are born Jews and who are Jews by halacha, and maybe their uh, ancestors were in Ashkenaz and not in France <laughs> in medieval times, uh, and therefore that's, they anyway don't marry people who are not of a pure lineage. They don't marry Sfaradim. They don't marry Ashkenazi Baalei Teshuvah. They don't marry a whole range of people. So the notion that this will cause the rift, no, what's gonna really cause the rift is, in my view, the opposite. If so many people who are lachically non-Jewish effectively assimilate into Jewish life in Israel and here, and here, let's not only talk about Israel, eventually, the whole notion of halachic definition of Jews, which is not according to observance. It's a miracle, right? The Talmudic rabbis this chose not to define Judaism on the basis of observance. Yisrael, he's worshiping idols, he's Jewish. That's a continuation of the biblical definition. God never says to the Jews, you're worshiping idols, you're not Jewish. Okay? So that definition, that, Whoever is Jewish is if you were born to a 
Jewish mother classically, or you converted according to halacha, and that's it. Behavior and belief is not the, everybody should believe, everybody should behave, but that's not the definition. Halachically, Yehovuzin, that's going to be endangered if we don't have gear. I can, if I can add, you know, I agree with everything uh, first of all said, but I think that you know this claim that you quoted is somewhat, somewhat, I'm dishonest or not fully honest because, because um, by, by by those who, who brings it up, because as as all said, you know this is the case already. Now who is going to marry those? Um, um, those converts, who's going to marry them? They're probably Israelis, secular Israelis, or less, or Sephardi, half secular Israelis. What about them? Aren't we responsible that they will marry within Judaism? So I titled my article, which the first article I published on Giyur, I titled I, with a quotation from Khatam Sofer, who said, we are not responsible for them. And, and I think what's going on here is we are responsible. And that's the difference. I, I just want to add uh, here to Tzvi's point, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the, the principle of Afbish Chatai Yisrael, who not simply as a, as a halachic or as a juridical principle, but anyone who has sinned is still a Jew. But here we have actually a cutting edge of what Arya had mentioned. Here you will find already back to the medieval period, it's a difference of are you religiously Jewish, are you part of the community? And you will find already in the Middle Ages where Afapishachatai Israel, who will not deny your Jewishness, but there will be communal separation. Right, so that's really the question moving forward. And Arya defined it very well in terms of, of Geirut, normally the two come together. When you have a breakdown between practice to not just an extent, you know, I, but you know, take, take the Western, I do nothing or I completely go against or whatever it may be, at some point you can be halachically Jewish, but the Jewish community, al pi halacha, you know, hilchot hatzibur al pi halacha, will not be required to, will not want to let you in in that regard. So it gets very complicated. In other words, af pi Yisrael was not the solution because that has to, that breaks down it, it, both in the medieval and modern period too. So just to make it more complicated. Go ahead. Somebody needs to summarize that because no one on this side of the room has any idea what was just said. Okay. It's okay. He's the, gonna, it will be repeated. The question was about, about a, a fascinating personality in Israel who is a member of the Knesset, a Sephardi, <laughs> and now <coughs> from uh, the political party Shas, that you probably might know, it's a, Har a Haredi a Sephardi political party who is fighting and struggling against all the Haredi rabbis um, that oppose the idea of Giyu, and, and he strongly supports the idea of Giyu. The interesting part of it is that he is not only a politician, but he is also a real Talmud Chacham. He is a real scholar. And he also knows to work, and is a hard worker. So he published two uh, massive uh, volumes. Uh, on that idea, why, according to Jewish law, there must be strong move, serious move, not only drops one by one, but serious move of welcoming the non-Jewish partners of the Jewish-Russian families 
into the Jewish community in Israel. Now, I don't know if I said the question or the answer. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. But the this question is, is what do you think of this? Well, it's obvious what I know. I mean, it was part of what I said. OK, I will only <laughs> add one point uh, in continuation. I will only add one point, which is that uh, when writing this book about Giyur, which was before Rabbi Amsalem's uh, works appeared, I had occasion over a period of about 20 years to go over mostly anything that I could lay my hands on that was ever written about Giyur. There's no question that historically, from the time of the Bible until now, including Maimonides, the most serious systematic analysis of Giyur and all of the issues of Giyur that was ever done by any rabbi is in this book, Zera Israel. Extremely systematic, extremely clear with propositions, bringing in all the authorities that disagree with him, giving reasoned analysis, and uh, setting uh, forth uh, what he understands to be the conclusion of all of this after surveying the entire literature, including all obscure Achronim, who was a Rosh, Metivta, and Mir. Okay, so he, and therefore, um, following your question, I would ask in return, how could it be that today in the United States, various leading rabbis are writing about issues of Giyur and making believe that that book doesn't exist? I know there are many more questions, but we actually are out of time. I want to thank our panelists for such a thought-provoking and wonderfully rich presentation this evening. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>